Hi everyone and once again welcome to our webinar. Today we will be doing the US market outlook before the market opens. So our investment analyst Kenneth will be going through his calls for the US market and after the webinar is done you can feel free to trade when the market opens. So as mentioned earlier on if you have any questions throughout the whole webinar, feel free to either raise your virtual hand or to type it into the question chat box. And now I will bring it over to Kenneth. Okay, uh, mic check, one, two. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Okay, great, great. Okay, hey. Uh, all right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the U.S. Uh, I guess the U.S. market outlook before the market opens. Um, I'm Kenneth Ko. I'm the macro strategist and uh, market analyst. So, uh, yeah, let's go through some really interesting trades that we have lined up for you today. Uh, okay. So just let you know if I sound cranky, it's only because I'm in the office, basically alone by myself, and uh, that's the reason why. So please bear with me if I sound cranky. And here we go. Okay. Okay, so here the a summary of the macro trading calls that we have. Okay, uh, regarding the U.S. market and also some other associated markets, which we think is important. After all, uh, we're all here to make some money, so we'll just give the best calls that we can. Okay, so the macro trading calls that we have, um, especially this week, will be one too long commodities, and we can proxy this by uh, looking at the GS GS GSI commodity ETF. Okay, which is a proxy of the GSEI, Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. Uh, second, uh, you can go to long the oil service sector. And here's the recommended sector we, we have chosen for you, which is the OIH. Okay. Um, for those people who are gold bugs and who have been monitoring gold prices, we actually have a short goal on the longer term call. Uh, of course, we'll go through the fundamentals and the technicals as well. Um, uh, later on in the in the program, uh, to show you that even though gold can be going up on the short term, but longer term you really should be bearish on it. Uh, number four, okay, uh, definitely bearish on the ten-year U.S. Treasuries. Now, note the research side uh, uh, for Philip Security Research. We have been underweight since fourth uh, of January uh, thirteen, okay, and we are maintaining this call. Okay, so far it is it has gone to our expectations, and we expect more bearishness. Finally, um, this is something that we felt that we wanted to alert investors that you shouldn't ignore it. It's a long China. It's to go, to go long China. I believe the reward for this can is probably comparably very significant compared to other types of trades that you can have, and that's why we included it. And later you're gonna see why. Okay, so let's go. All right. So outlook for the market, well, at least the U.S. market. So U.S. market correction, it actually looks encouraging on the daily. On the daily chart, it is looking encouraging. But I want to note that there is, you want to note, there is no weekly buy signal as yet. Okay, so just note that. Okay, so U.S. still in short-term correction. Um, the correction has paused. Okay, but let's wait for the weekly buy signal first before jumping in. Uh, bonds are still bearish. Now, this is a good trade. Industrial commodities show increased buying on breakout. That's and this is another trade you can make as well. Uh, gold has short-term bullish momentum, momentum, <laughs> but we believe it's uh, is bearish uh, longer term. Uh, finally, the CSI 300, which is a proxy to the China market (HS), shows a potential long-term double bottom. Uh, let me stress: we believe this is a long-term double bottom. So the reward for this can be months and and even years, all right? And an intermediate cycle on the MACD. This could be the start of a major bottom in the bull market. Okay, all right, my mouse, my computer just hanged. Uh, give me a second. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay, uh, apologies. Okay, apparently I've got an echo, so I need to speak a bit louder. Is it is it better now? I'm I'm putting the microphone closer to my to my lips. Okay, uh, let me know if this is okay. All right. So strategy for the U.S. market is to wait for correction to finish its toll, but there are other trades you could make, and I'll show you in a second. All right. So let me show you some some things for the U.S. Uh, economy first. All right. 
And the conclusion to what I'm telling you is the reason why we want to continue shorting gold okay, and, and to long the SPX or the S&P 500 after the correction. Okay, So in terms of economy, um, the US economy is actually picking up. As you can see, the top left, we have US new orders, um, capital expenditure, non-defense, non-aircraft. And as you can see, for at least for the past few months, there's actually been an uptick in the quarter on quarter and year on year improvement, uh, sorry, uh, performance. Okay, uh, this is the three month average. So this shows you that momentum has definitely shifted towards the improvement in terms of US new orders. Okay, the trade deficit, the US trade deficit is actually finally actually on a downtrend. Okay, this will build confidence for the US dollar. Um, US non farm payrolls essentially holding steady in positive territory okay so this is um, good news for the job market all right and you can see that the US government budget okay right this is the now based on these things we see that the forward-looking core business investment is robust all right uh, trade deficit is narrowing uh, employment situation is on a very steady trend okay um, even though July had a below expectation print it, it's, it's good it's good to note that we like to smooth out the data because um, monthly monthly data points can be very volatile, and when you do smooth the data out, you will see that yes, it, when you smooth it out with the three month moving average and the twelve month, you can see that yes, we've been holding quite steady, right? And finally, the government budget uh, it's is narrowing, okay? Uh, and as the sequester works its way through the budget, so now it's narrowing, and we believe that. As the sequester works out, this budget this budget deficit should improve. Okay, and all this uh, essentially means two things: the U.S. economy is picking up, and there should be increased confidence in the U.S. dollar. Okay, so what that means is that as the U.S. dollar, okay, so here's a chart of the U.S. dollar index and gold. So the gold is in uh, the gold is in gold color, haha, and the the dollar is in the color of a dollar. Okay, yes. Corny, it's late. Okay, bear with me. Okay, so as you can see, as the dollar has been strengthening, as confidence uh, increases in the dollar, gold prices have been coming down. All right, and because um, where we are, where we believe we are in the business cycle and the robustness of the U.S. market, we believe this trend will continue, and that's why fundamentally uh, it is just bearish for for gold. Even though, as a technical analyst myself, I'm actually a, a technical analyst as well as a macro analyst, I, I will concede that it's possible for gold to continue going up on the short term. But long term, there's too much headwinds for it to go up much longer. Um, but we'll look into more, more detail over here. So this is an actual um, uh, gold chart, all right, gold spot price. And as you can see, all right, so we know that since this double top, okay, um, no, the uh, the research team has been bearish on gold for months now. Okay, so this is not new. This call is not new. We've been bearish, I think, at this point over here, early, early this year, and basically, so we took a, a big dive with a from the double top, and now we've had a about a twenty percent retracement back up here. So the question people are always asking is, oh, is this a resumption of a bull move for gold? Right, that's the key question everyone wants to know. Uh, is this will there be another down cycle or is this the start of a new bear market? Uh, sorry, a new bull market. That means we'll exceed, you know, the seventeen hundred and go further. Okay, in our analysis, the, we think the answer is no because the fundamental headwinds that we talked to you about. Okay, but there's more. Now, because we believe that the fundamentals are bearish for gold, hence we are looking for a place to either sell our goal or take a short position. And so here are some recommendations for you. Okay, the, this region here in blue, which is roughly the 1600 region, please note that this is a very strong resistance level. And should the price of goal actually hit this level, this is a great place for selling. Okay, great place. Now, at the same time, for those people who are familiar with, let's say the RSI, okay, in this case I use the MFI, which is the money flow index. The money flow index is actually similar to the RSI, except it actually takes into account uh, money flow in and money flow out. But the way you use it is essentially the same. Uh, I'm going to show you a trick, and the trick is this. Uh, for the RSI, I know that you've probably learned, if you did technical analysis, that if you are above 80, it's overbought. 
you should sell it, and if it's below 20, it's oversold, you should, you should buy it. But that's not really how you should use the MFI. Okay, that's not really how you should do it. What you need to do is you have to know whether you're in a bull market or bear market first before using it. So if you believe you're in a bear market, then the upper limit for the MFI is actually 70. It is not 80. Okay, once it hits 70, that's already the upper limit. So therefore, two convenient places for you to sell gold is either when the price hits the blue zone here, the actual price resistance target, or if when the MFI actually continues higher and hits the dotted line over here. Here are two places for you, high percentage, uh, high percentage reward places for you to sell. Okay. Now the reason why uh, it could price could continue further is because you notice that the MACD has actually crossed here. So when the MACD crosses, there's usually a cycle up. The question is only whether is it going to be a long cycle or a short cycle. So because of the fundamental reasons I told you about, we believe it will be a short cycle and not a long one. Hence, um, I don't like to predict where gold is going. Okay, I hate doing that. I've only predicted prices um, twice in my career. <laughs> um, so happens I got both correct. But if you point a gun to my head and ask me where's gold going and you force me to say something, I'll say because of this cycle, I think price should either consolidate at this level or go slightly higher, but it should definitely it should probably reverse down to its um, downtrend when it hits the blue zone or when the MFI hits the, this this part of this dotted line over here. That's just my best guess scenario, and I cannot be hundred percent certain, but that's just my feel based on the probabilities. Another reason why I believe this is so is because of this last chart at the bottom here. Now this, this, this chart at the bottom of the chart here is the relative strength between the GDX, which is the gold miners ETF and gold. You see here, I'm just using the relative per price performance of the gold miners and gold. It's a simple ratio. I'm taking the gold miner price divided by gold price. Now why is this important? The reason why it's important is, is like this. The gold miners is much more sensitive uh, is very, very, very sensitive to the price of gold. And people who trade the GDX are also more aggressive. So when you see prices spiking upwards like this, so in the case of our case, we've been going up since July. Okay. Now, how strong is this conviction? If this move is the start of a, bad, a bull market, then you would expect that the relative performance of the GDX to gold to actually go higher. You expect people to be more excited on the gold miners than gold itself. If that's if you that's if people are expecting gold to go higher on a long term basis. A case in point is in October of 08. See October 08 is over here, and you can see this first move here is a, it's a bull market, right? We know because it's gone up by so much. It's gone up for the next three years. Notice that the first three six months of this move up here, from October 08 onwards, you will see. At the relative strength chart, that the gold miners actually outperformed gold in this whole period. That means that even though gold was going up in price, the gold miners was going up even more in price proportionately. That shows a great bullishness. We don't see that behavior at this point. So this also tells me that this move is just a how do I put it? It's a muted move or a neutral move. Um, for me to be convinced that this is a start of something really big and new, I would like to see uh, this relative performance turn up. So I don't see that right now. So based on the evidence here, uh, plus the fundamental evidence, um, we are long-term bullish, but short-term, sorry, we are long-term bearish, but short-term could be bullish. Yeah. And that's about gold. All right, so where are we on the S&P? Okay, uh, quick summary, right? Uh, basically, this is the weekly chart for the S&P uh, for the last one and a half years. Here's where we are right now. We have a nice indecision candle which is above the 10, 10 week moving average. Okay, well, the call that we've been putting out, um, okay, if, if you've been following us every Monday on our weekly webinar, by the way, um, Philip Securities Research has a weekly webinar at 11.15, which is free. Uh, you should definitely check it out. Okay, it's got good stuff there. Uh, we've been guiding for a month now that the S&P was gonna correct. In fact, when, when the S&P was consolidating here in August, uh, we actually called and we said that the probability of it dropping down was very much higher than going up. We really said that. And uh, sure enough, it did. Okay, so our call is, so since then, uh, our stance was short-term correction until proven otherwise. Now, 
to be honest, right now the otherwise is starting to show some hints. So this otherwise is starting to show hints. Now it's not just because of a breakout from the 10 moving average, okay? That is basic technical analysis. But let's go deeper. Okay, why do I say so? Now you you notice um, that as this price has come down, uh, a few things are encouraging. Um, first of all, this NYMO is called the McLaren oscillator. The McLaren oscillator it measures it's an indicator of the number of stocks that have been increasing versus decreasing. Okay, so all the stocks in the NYSE it counts all of them, and every day uh, if there are more stocks that go up than down, then this essentially ticks up. Or actually, to be more exact, the McLaren oscillator calculates the momentum of the number of stocks going up. So what does that mean? Well, it means this. You must be on the lookout for divergent activity. When there's divergent activity, okay, here's a trick by the way. Um, something that some people may know, some people may not know, but it's an important trick if you're trying to do detective work into figuring out where the S&P is really going. I'm going to show you an example here. Uh, okay. Like for example, you sometimes the McLaren oscillator can actually react first before um, the McLaren and the and this is the relative strength between the Russell and, and the S and P. I use them both uh, to give me a hint of the quality of the up move or down move. As you can see from here from May to July, price has been coming down, right? But at this period, right, the Russell to S and P relative strength actually has been going up, and you also can see that. In a sense, right, the McLaren also started to react first before while price was coming down. These two things tell me, uh, gives a great hint that the long term trend is actually still up and that you should get ready to buy. Okay, the, the Russell, by the way, is the Russell 2000. The Russell 2000 is, uh, is essentially an index of a lot of US small caps. So, US small caps are very sensitive to the economic situation, right? And so, when people are actually really bullish about the economy, you would expect the Russell to outperform the S&P. And that's what happened over here. So even though price was coming down, uh, the Russell was outperforming the S&P. Not the absolute price, but the Russell was not uh, dropping in price as much as the S&P, showing a confidence in the economy itself. Hence, it greater the probability that this was a technical correction and not a correction based on fundamentals. Okay, So you see that here, you see that here. So right now we are here, and you'll see that the Russell has been kind of holding steady, but the McLaren oscillator has been actually increasing. So this is actually encouraging. All right, so that leads me to believe that it is possible for this to actually keep going up more. Okay, but there's other evidence that that is not that great, and I'll, I'll show you in a second. Okay, but just note that on the short term, it does look encouraging. Uh, well. Okay, just breath. Okay, so these are breath indicators. I uh, just want to note, okay, that um, in this correction here, I like to measure VIX levels, and here's the VIX. Okay, so since the correction, the VIX has basically chugged this way to about. Can I sorry to interrupt you, but could you explain a little bit of what is the VIX? Oh, what's the VIX? Okay, mm -hmm. question. What is the VIX? The VIX is essentially a, a fear index. It measures what we call the uh, volatility of the options market uh, and the key thing to note is that at times of panic or fear the, the volatility of the option market becomes higher much higher people are trading uh, I guess with more uh, reckless abandon and so that's what the VIX actually measures so in a sense the VIX is called the, uh, is, is likened to a fear index the more fearful or panicky the market is the higher the VIX uh, would increase and how we use this is that we like to use the VIX level to show you, to give an indication of how deep a correction can go. So for example, from and you, like, and you compare VIX levels to its relative levels over here. So for example, in small corrections here, like in uh, April 2013, in small ones, you notice that the VIX only makes it to about 17, 18, and then it stops, see? But for this larger one from uh, May to July, it, the VIX actually went on a lot higher so essentially, the higher the VIX is, you can I guess you can say the more oversold on the short term the index the the S and P is. So what I told my um, 
my my re my viewers uh the, for the last two weeks is I I monitored the VIX for them, and actually actually when it came last week at this point here I already said I already told my viewers that um that this correction was encouraging it could turn and it actually did turn this week and the reason why I said that is because the VIX last week hit a level which was already very close to the prior correction levels okay the only question now is is this correction going to be a larger one or a short one because if it's a short one in a sense you could say it's over because of the VIX levels okay uh, so that's so that's where we are right now so the, the breath indicators I'll say is just showing normal behavior at this point in time I, I don't want to go into the rest at this point uh, it will take a bit long. Maybe next time we can have a session specifically on technical analysis. Okay, we'll, I'll go into these very specific indicators that you probably won't learn in basic textbooks. Okay. Now, if we go on the weekly, all right. I just want to note that uh, although although the daily has been pretty encouraging, but as of today, there is still no weekly buy signal. And if you're looking to make an intermediate move, uh, moves that you know that you can hold for a few weeks, right? Then you really should be looking at the weekly for the buy signal. And so we've had a series of red candles, and we've only, we've only had one recently. Um, what do I consider a weekly buy signal? Obviously, there are many techniques, but one convenient one to use is like this: um, you could wait for the price to either break out of the ten-week moving average, which is the blue line. So if it actually price breaks out. And if you're still bullish on the US market, you can actually go and buy. Or you can have wait for two successive white candles, and the second white candle has to break the high of the candle before it. Now, if you're very kiasu, and if you're Singaporean, you probably are, and you you know, then you can actually wait for both. Both conditions to be done. You can wait for the break of the 10 week MA and uh, two successive white candles together uh, for upside signal to buy. Uh, if you just look back, you will see that it works pretty well. For example, if you over here, you had that over here. See, in uh, November of 2012, you had a series of red candles, and then you had one white candle, and finally you had another white candle, and this white candle was higher than the one before it. So you could have bought here, and as you can see, if you bought here, you would have actually helped this whole investment uh, to potentially up here before you sell it. And of course, selling is the same signal. Uh, if you see two red candles, and the red second red candle is closes below the low of the last red candle, you can also take uh, you can take your cut loss there, and and get stopped out. Okay, uh, these these are just uh, I suppose basic um, trend techniques. There's probably others that you could use, but I'm just uh, recommending one. Okay, if you don't have one already. All right. So I would say that if you're bullish on the U.S. economy, that a break of 1665 would imply further upside. Okay, it does imply that. Okay, we'll continue. Okay, um, but those are just signals. If you need um, downside and upside targets, um, well, here are the major ones. All right. Now, if it's on the downside. Okay, if there is another cycle down, okay, note that uh, this red zone is the nearest uh, support, and this blue zone is a high probability target. So I will say that if this actually cycles down, if it does cycle down, the probability of hitting this blue zone is extremely high. Okay, I don't have time to go into why this is um, so high, but it has to do with uh, Fibonacci retracement levels. It also has to do with the fact that this is the number four Elliott wave. If you follow Elliott waves, and this is the number four, and usually when it comes to impulse wave retracements, it, high chance that it comes down to the number four wave. Okay, so this is number four as well. Okay, um, I guess Elliott waves will have to do make do for another webinar. So if you invite me back, uh, I might maybe I can explain all these things. So like we do have to arrange for you another want, find this helpful and you want more just for you. Oh, we do. Oh, okay. <laughs> it looks like it looks like we do <laughs> okay. have to now, right? I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Uh, back uh, okay. to your presentation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm just checking, Melissa. Can everyone hear you? I just unmuted myself. Oh, so okay. anyway. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. when you talk, 
So when you talk, the whole audience can hear you, is it? Yes, they can. Oh, that's cool. Okay. I mean, I only say so because Melissa has such a nice voice. But anyway, <laughs> right, back to the presentation. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. so, so basically, if it does cycle down, if it does, right, the downside target, high probability is this blue zone. Okay. Uh, if not, then okay, it's probably going to go higher from here. In this particular case, uh, all right, the PPO, okay, is a percentage, uh, what does it stand for? Oh, percentage price oscillator. It's basically a percentage version of the MACD. Okay, if, if you're familiar with the MACD, it's very similar and it's almost crossing. Okay, so that's why there could be a cycle up. And the McLaren, here's McLaren as well, it's in positive territory. Okay, which means finally the number of stocks, number of stocks going up is actually higher than the number of stocks going down now. The number, okay? So it's a breath indicator. So these two are encouraging. So there's a good chance that this could continue up if if price can actually break through this 50 MA right here. This is quite a heavy thing, heavy uh resistance. Okay. But based on the, what I see in the PPO and the McLaren, there could be it could be a chance it breaks through. Okay. But if it doesn't break through, you might want to hold your horses and not jump in yet. Okay. Now, if there is a retracement and it hits down to this blue zone, I would consider this zone to be a major buy opportunity based on the fundamentals of the US economy right now. Okay, it is quite good. Okay, so let's continue. Oops, okay. Now let's go into a specific sector sector itself. Now this is the industrial sector. Okay, now we know the S and P. I mean, I mean the U.S. market has many sectors. So this is the industrial sector. Now, why am I looking at the industrial sector? Okay, the reason why I'm showing you this sector is because right now the industrial sector is actually the leading sector in the S and P right now. I will show you some sector rotation charts later on for you to see. So if this is the leading sector, right, then you can then it's important to know where you think this is going because if this sector goes on a cycle down. The chance that the S and P goes down uh, as well is very high because they're heavily correlated. Because this is the leading sector right now, uh, I just want to show you that this was the chart of the industrial sector uh, three weeks ago. So three weeks ago, all right, I think nineteenth uh, August, this was the chart. Okay, and uh, and this is the exact slide that you that I showed three weeks ago, and I said at that time based on other signals that I saw that I suspected that the industrials will follow this pattern. I actually drew the lines here and I drew the direction over here. This is what happened two weeks ago. Just want to show you how things have played out since then. So two weeks ago the chart looked like that. It did bounce off the support line and hit my target. Last week it actually did this. It went into my it went into my range already. Now since then uh, so last week I told people to see whether it's going to break on the once you hit my zone here, which I predicted, I asked people, the viewers, to see whether it will break down this bottom support or this top resistance. And this week, we are here. Now, good news is that we broke through this support, uh, this resistance line. Bad news is that this is an indecision candle. In other words, and since this is the leading sector, I would like to see some more strength in the industrials before I become bullish on the S and P. Uh, itself. So since this is an indecision candle, I would like to wait this week to see if price can stay above this dotted line. If you can stay above this dotted line for a week, now that will give more support to further upside. Okay, so keep an eye on the industrials and this is the XLI by the way, the XLI. Um, if you want to know how I predicted this, uh, you would have to go to the archive uh, webinar that I did two or three weeks ago and I explained how I predicted this. And this is one of the other two calls that I ever made where I even told people where I think the price is going to. Okay. Okay, let's look at some sector glances. Now these these are don't be intimidated by online charts here. Essentially these are just price charts of the different sectors of the S P. So you got the cyclicals. Uh, cyclicals is just another name for consumer discretionary. Uh, this consumer discretionary means um, you know shops that uh, things that you buy when you have a lot of money, things that you buy if you which is not a necessity but you just want to buy it. Okay, so things like automobiles is in cyclicals. Okay, okay. Um, so here we have technology XLI which you just saw industrials. Now 
what, what's important here is not the price uh, chart itself. I want to divert your attention on the bottom half of each of these slides, uh, these charts. The bottom half shows you the relative strength between that sector and the S&P itself. I'm dividing the price of this sector <laughs> to the price of the S&P. Okay, what's important here is I'll show you in a moment, is you want to see the relative performance and strength versus the S&P. Okay? And what I want to show you is this, that despite prices going up and down, based on the idealized business cycle and sector rotation, based on the phase of the business cycle that we're in now, okay, we, and, uh, and I believe in stage four and five, which I'll show you what that means later on, uh, it should follow a particular set pattern. For example, at this stage of the business cycle, you expect cyclicals to outperform to be the leading sector followed by industrials, materials, and energy. Okay, this is how the idealized sector rotation goes. Of course, one can argue that um, different, dif uh, different cycles are different, I agree. But it's good to know that what's the ideal, so you can at least do your analysis on it to see what the ideal is supposed to be, and then do your tweaks from there. So you can notice one thing. Cyclicals, can you see that since April, it has been outperforming the S&P. So as the S&P goes up or down, the cyclicals have just been doing better in price. And only in July, it started to normalize. It stopped outperforming, basically. But look at the industrials. Industrials is here, top right. The industrials only started to outperform in May. It actually lagged the cyclicals by a month. See? Look at the sequence, cyclicals and industrials. Followed by materials. In materials, as you can see, Essentially, the price really only recovered in July. July is when it finally turned up as well. And look at energy. So energy, same thing. It has kind of been down, but it only turned out in performance in August. It was, so as you can see, it actually lagged each other. So when I see this sequence, it gives you a hint of where you are on the business cycle. And that's very, very important if you want to know where, whether stocks can keep going up or not. Okay, so let's continue. So just note the sequence. Um, this is another very, very useful chart. Okay, it's just the relative, it's called the relative uh, uh, rotation chart. Essentially, it's the same thing. Okay, um, the, these, um, these symbols are the sectors which I mentioned about. So this S, 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 M, A, T is the material sector. This is the energy sector. INFT is the technology sector. This is industrials. Uh, what I want to show you is the direction of how they are performing. So the two axes are as follows. The, the x-axis or the horizontal axis is the relative strength ratio versus the S&P itself. Okay, I repeat. The x-axis is the relative strength price versus the S&P or the broad market itself. Essentially, if your dot is on the right side, okay, if you're on the right side, it means that your relative uh, price has been outperforming the S&P. If on the left side, of this dotted line, which is the 100 line, it means your price has not been performing the S&P. The other sectors have been doing better than you, essentially, on average. Okay. Now, what about the y-axis? The y-axis measures the momentum or or the rate of change of this relative strength ratio. The rate of change. So, if you're on top, it means that your relative strength is actually increasing over time. And if you're at the bottom here, it means your relative strength has been decreasing over time. So based on this chart, you have four quadrants. The quadrant that you don't want to be in is here. If you're on this quadrant, it means not only are you have you not been outperforming the S&P, but it's even getting worse. Okay. Oh, by the way, this is the last 12 weeks of movement. So this, for example, in the industrial chart, this dot here is where the industrial performance is for this week. And each trail is one week before it. So 12 weeks ago, the industrial sector was here. So here you can see what's actually improving and what's rotating. And you see that for the last 12 weeks, industrials have taken the lead. And what's, and what's interesting in my opinion is what's in this sector over here. This sector shows how the price has lagged the S&P, but it's improving. So I'm actually very curious about this sector. And of course, this one as well. So here's the leading sector, industrials, but materials and energy, these two are the improving ones. Okay, and that's key for me. 
and most important is also knowing that consumer staples and utilities and uh, telecommunications, uh, these three are underperforming. So this tells me that the economy is doing well. When you have this, th these three underperforming and these improving, it, it means the economy itself is actually doing well, despite what you've been hearing. Okay, okay let's go further. Uh, just a quick one. For the last two weeks, this just shows you which sectors have been doing well. So as you mentioned earlier, for the last two weeks, technology, industrials, materials, and energy have been outperforming the rest. Okay, next. Okay. So what's the point of showing you all that sector rotation stuff? Okay, basically, this is the idealized market and economic cycle. The red, the red chart is the stock market cycle. Okay, and this tells you that when energy starts taking the lead, when energy starts uh, outperforming everybody else, right, that the stock market could have topped already. That's very key. Okay, when energy has, when energy has, has uh, is doing the best, the stock market has topped. Okay, and Can this stock market enough, top, do you mind, tops, um, right? Explaining a little bit as to why is there this relationship between the stock market and the energy sector? Why is it that you know when it, the stock market peaks, it also means that the energy sector is um. Yeah, doing well, or um, yeah, that's the relationship I gather. Oh, okay, I I could, but uh, if if I do so, it will, this presentation will take a long time. Ah, so we will have to push that to another TA session, huh? Uh, yeah, un unless the viewers want to just quickly chime in and and say that they want to hear my explanation, or else I like to move on. Um, okay, we'll just move on first, and if you guys want to know more about the relationship as I just asked, please um, raise your virtual hand or just type it into the question chat box, okay? Oh yeah, you know, at the end of this presentation, uh, those who want to know can just type the question in and I'll, I'll explain it then. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, back to you. Okay, but in the meantime, I, the key thing I want that you note is that uh, when energy takes the lead, that's the hint that stocks might be at its end, okay? Now this is not a perfect uh, model. Okay, it's not perfect, but it gives you a, a rough sequence so you know, and that's the beauty of this. And this, oh, and this top of the stock market occurs uh, roughly around here. Uh, this is idealized, like, actually, it should be around here. And this is where the economy is in mid recovery. Okay, mid recovery. Okay, when the economy is in the middle of its recovery, the stock market is more or less topped out. By the time you're at full recovery, the stock market is pro has probably been going down already. Okay. Uh, so based on the fundamentals that we've been looking at and the sectors that have been doing well, uh, we believe that we're in, in this zone over here. So stocks actually still have some some legs to go, although uh, in general there's not much left. All right. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, it depends on what market you're looking at as well. So uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. All right. Let's go further. Okay. Intermarket relationships. This is also very key if you want to know where you are on the global business cycle. I've got three here, three asset classes here. Okay, uh, don't be intimidated. The top is the U.S. Treasury's ten years. Okay, we all know it's been on a bull market since '06. Okay, bottom here is the Dow Jones World Index. Uh, I used to use the S&P, but I decided to use the Dow Jones World now to show you that actually on a world world point of view. We have not actually hit the top of the stock market from the, from uh, the last bull run. We have not yet. Okay, but close. At the bottom here is your S and P GSTI or Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. It's a measurement of the heavily traded commodity futures used by industry, basically. Okay, it's quite heavily weighted on energy, but it includes. Uh, things like um, copper as well, industrial metals, as well as some agriculture. As you can see, for the first time, two things have happened. All right. Okay, first, I want you to note one thing. Bonds has been going up for the last seven years. And only recently, we've had a strong down move that actually pierced the trend line. And by the way, this is why we're bearish on bonds. We expect this to actually go down to start the bear market, by the way, for bonds. Okay, stocks. Last six years up, commodities did go up for uh, 
two and a half years, and then we believe this move is not a down move, it's a long consolidation. And uh, one month ago, uh, we did state that we believe this is a consolidation and it should break anytime soon. And sure enough, just this week, it finally broke, broke here and broke here. So it's good to know that um, you know our calls were more or less right. Okay, if I go deeper into the chart, this is it. This is the same charts on the daily, so you can see closely what has happened. Uh, yes, there's definitely a break here for the bonds. Okay, going down, and there's definitely a break here for commodities. Okay, so how do you play this? If you want to play shorting the bonds, okay, there's an ETF here which is called the TBT. This TBT, uh, you can Google it. You can find out, but essentially it's a double short leverage bond. So, essentially, when the price of the treasury goes down by one percent. Uh, the TBT is supposed to go up by 2%. So if you buy this, you're playing the short side of uh, this, this drop. Okay, uh, It's not that efficient, but it's one of the more popular ETFs to use. A lot of people use this. Similarly for the commodity, if you want to play the long commodity, right? Um, this is the ETF GSG, which plays this exact uh, index. It plays the exact one. Okay, So these are the two you can play for these two markets. Now, this is just the technicals, right? Technicals. Let's look at the fundamentals. Okay, why long commodities? Well, very simple. The global growth is essentially picking up. US, Eurozone, Japan, and these three make up of the big chunk of world GDP. Okay, uh, PMI's purchasing, uh, purchasing managers uh, index is picking up. Okay, China is improving. Okay, oh, we didn't talk about China yet, but I will. But it's improving. Okay, just take my word for it. Anyway, you have no choice. I'm presenting. Okay, altogether, that's uh, 70, that's seventy five percent of the global output. Okay, uh, so here's the eurozone manufacturing PMI. Here's the service PMI, and you can see essentially, yes, we are out of recession. We are above fifty, which is expansionary. Okay, and so we finally, and we believe this will continue. Okay, cycle has turned up for the eurozone PMIs. Um, uh, this is a smooth three-month average, by the way, of quarterly versus quarterly. Okay, quarterly versus quarterly. I mean, sorry, quarterly reported numbers. I'm sorry. Okay, now for the U.S., uh, same thing for manufacturing and services. Uh, the U.S. Is actually doing better. It's been actually above fifty for a much longer time. But more importantly, recently, last month, there's been a big tick. Can you see the big tick? Big improvement as well. So not only are you above fifty, but there's an improvement as well. Uh, Japan, same thing, we have uptick, and uh, the global PMI, so this accumulates all the PMIs of the world and it's weighted, the global PMI is generally positive. It's above 50 and it's on an uptick as well. So the, the global economy is what we call, I suppose, early to mid expansion or early expansion. So when the economy is doing well, it's just a matter of time before commodity prices have, has to go up. And that's why we say long commodities. Here's another thing about uh, another piece of evidence about commodities. Now, when you look, the good thing about looking at ETFs for for technical analysis is because you have volume traded. That's very interesting. So you don't really see this on the GSCI commodity index itself. But if you look at the GSG, which is the which is the ETF that trades it you'll see that there is a breakout from this long trend line. There's a breakout, and this breakout is on high volume, much higher relative to the rest of the days. So this is what we call a conviction breakout. Usually, when this happens, there's further upside. Okay, There's further upside, high probability. Okay, Of course, PPO is above uh, zero, which is great too. So if you are a trader, okay, if you are, this is a very easy trade to make. You can buy this. I'll set my uh, target to $37. Um, oh, this target is just based on price objective. Using, uh, if you're familiar with price objectives, using a breakout from this uh, inverted bowl projected upwards. Okay, can even go higher depending on how bullish the market is. And um, you could always set a cut loss at $32. It's a very, very convenient place to set your cut loss. Okay, so it's a trade which is probably worth a shot. The risk reward is in your favor. Okay, so that's commodities. Hopefully, I've given you enough evidence that this is good. Okay, we had the 
GSG chart itself, we've got intermarket relationship plus we have business cycle where we think we are. So that's three pieces of information already. Okay, now since we know that commodities and crude oil is going to do well, well, what about the oil service sector? All right. So as you can see, the OIH is the price uh, price chart of the oil service sectors. So this will include, you know, your 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 companies like uh, Slumberger and uh, NOV. And I I did this chart actually one month ago, and I said that uh, on a breakout of here, you can consider a trade as long as you stay above the blue line. And so recently, that's what happened. It broke out. It stayed above the blue line, and finally, it made this jump. But more importantly, crude oil has is, has also broken out, and also the relative strength between the OIH and S&P, hey, it's finally turning up. See, relative strength versus S&P is turning up. So, the, so if you're going to trade the S&P, let's say you are, the probability of not losing or losing less is much higher here. Okay, because the relative strength is getting better. So if the S&P goes up by a few percentage points, you can expect this to go up for even more than that. If the S&P decides to fall a few percentage points, um, you can expect the OIH to not fall as much. So this would be a higher probability trade if you want to do the S&P, in my opinion. Okay, This is just a recommended uh, target price and cut loss based on technicals. I just want to let you know that. Okay, so what's the point of showing you uh, bonds, stocks, and commodities? Here's another idealized business cycle, but instead of showing you the different sectors that are supposed to do well, I've showed you the three different asset classes that are, that are supposed to do well, so you know where you are in the business cycle. So remember, bonds, finally, for the first time in months or years, did a big spike down. And, I, and we believe that it's the start of a bear market for bonds, which is precisely phase four, precisely. Okay? Stocks, as you know, have continued to move up, but based on the GS, uh, GS, oh, sorry, uh, Dow Jones World Index, right? stocks have gone up but has not reached as high yet. Or almost there, and commodities have started to outperform, right? To basically uh, break out, and commodities are supposed to go up here. So a midpoint breakout is also here. So that's why we think we're right here in phase four, like so. So in this strategy, you're gonna short the bonds, long on stocks, uh, especially energy and materials, and long industrial commodities. This this is the strategy that we are recommending right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, say you're shorting the okay. So you're gonna short the ten-year U.S. Treasury, right? But uh, you're wondering if I short the U.S. Treasuries, when do I take my profit, or how much can it go? Um, okay, I'm just gonna quickly explain this chart. Now for the U.S. Treasuries, the bottom chart here in, in brown is the two-year yield. Okay, it's a two-year yield. The green is the U.S. Treasury yield spread between the 10-year and the 2-year. Now, we're using the 10-year as your long-dated bonds and your 2. The 10-year is your long-dated bonds and the 2-year is your short-dated bonds. Okay, And of course, blue is your 10-year yield. The key thing we want to look at is what's in green. This shows you the historical spread between the two yields, the short and the long. And what we want to note is historically what has been the maximum spread possible. And if you look on the uh, this axis over here, you see that the maximum spread has always been around uh, basically below three. Below three is your maximum spread between the two year and ten year. Now, why are we showing you this? Okay, uh, very simple. Okay, um, we're showing you this because right now we know the Fed tapering is going to happen, and people are also expecting uh, Fed to even raise their rates after two years. So this bearishness in, 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 the, in the treasuries is going to happen. The question is just a matter of when. Now, the two-year the, the two tre two year yield or two-year treasury um, or the short-term treasury is fixed usually by the Fed's funds rate. And that's not going to change for two years. So this yield is probably going to stay very close to here. It's not going to move. The only thing that can move is your 10-year yield. This can move through market forces. Okay. And since we know the maximum spread historically has been less than three, we believe that this will probably spread have a spread which is equal. And if 
if you're if it's true and you have a historic spread of three, then what's your price target? Okay, I'm gonna skip this out okay, here. Uh, just ignore these two charts for now. Okay. Essentially, if you look at this, this is your TNX. It's just a chart that I use because it's convenient. It's your ten-year Treasury note yield. Uh, I know you, on this axis you see that it says thirty and twenty seven point five. I don't know why it's like that, but essentially thirty means three percent and two twenty seven point five is two point seven percent. Okay. The point is that if you use your ten year to two year as a ceiling, the spread based on maximum spread, the ten year treasury yield can actually serve legs to go all the way to here, at least. And that's only if you use a spread between the 10 year and the 2 year, which is conservative. If you took the maximum spread between the 10 year and the 3 month, your ceiling is actually much higher over here. So, if you take a short position on treasuries, this makes a very, this region between the two boundaries makes a great place, a great place to set your profit taking on the short term. And this is a great trade because on the short term, it can go it can actually go up to this level here. Now, in two years' time, if the Fed decides to raise the Fed funds rate, then that will even move the short-term rates, and this will probably move the 10-year even further up. So as you can see, this gives you your, just your intermediate price target. And when the Fed raises their rates, uh, Fed funds rate, your price target can even go higher. This is based on your Treasury note yield. So if you, if you want to play this, what you would do is you would buy your TBT, okay? And you can actually refer to this chart for your price target. When the when the you when you notice the ten year yield hitting this zone here, in this sweet spot, that's where you can consider taking your profit from the TBT. Okay, but if you're really bearish on the and you're really bearish on treasuries, and if you choose to wait even longer past two years, there's probably a chance that the target for your yield will go even higher. Okay. Okay, I gotta move because we're running out of time. Uh, oops, I already showed you this one. Uh, okay, oh, I'm sorry, I got repeated slides. Okay, finally, right? Uh, long China. Now, I, I know this is a US market outlook, but we're all here to make money. So when we have high conviction trades, we have to show it to you. Now, here's the interesting thing about China. Okay, actually, my team and I, um, Joshua and I, um, we discussed this and actually we were bullish on China even from last week but we only managed to get the report out this week okay why are we we think that the CSI 300 okay which is a shares a, a, a index of a shares we think that it put in a double bottom in the weekly and valuations are rock bottom that implies that we could be on a long-term move up okay if you at this point why okay basically Finally, the fundamentals are looking up. Here we have China transport industrial production by volume. This is just a, I know it's just a rough gauge of uh, transportation and production. It's a rough gauge. It's, it's volume only. Okay. The point is that it's had an improvement. You can see a cycle up here. If you look at the green as well as the brown, which is the three month and the 12 month average of year on year improvement. It finally has an uptick. The, the profit reported profits of industrial companies in China finally has also had a sharp uptick, right? And it upticked at the same time from uh, uh, three, four years ago in the great financial crisis. At the same level, it upticked as well. So we think these are cycle turns, essentially. China CPI, same thing. We had an uptick, improvement in the growth rates. Oh, sorry, sorry. Not say an uptick, sorry, but the, the China CPI, this is actually a measure of inflation. What we want to show, what we want to show basically is that inflation is under control. It is not high, it's stable. And because it's stable, we don't have a threat of the uh, big threat of the China central bank raising their rates yet. So you have improving uh, improving economy in, in China, plus inflation is under control. That's very, very key. Here's even more key. This is the cycle PE chart, price to earnings chart. Price to earnings, uh, if you're familiar, right, is, is basically the price of your stock versus the earnings. And the lower it is, the cheaper the stock is. And what's important here is not the price. What's important here is that the levels that you are right now are all at the historical lows at January 09 
and Gen 06. And these lows also marked historical lows in the China price market as well. So now your valuations has finally hit rock bottom as well. So not only do you have an improvement, in, a potential improvement in the economy, controlled inflation, the valuations are at historical lows. So if you had to bet whether you're at the bottom of the China market, now it's time to bet. Looking at the CSI 300 chart itself, you will also see that on the weekly chart, okay, this is the uh, four-year chart, finally in the last three years, you finally have a double bottom for the first time, a double bottom. And, the, and this recent double bottom was marked with a very big rejection candle. You can see that the price was threatening to tank down. But when it tanked down, there's a big rejection up, and that's because the, the, the China government at its opportune time released good but encouraging uh, economic data at this point to push the price up. So we believe that this is a great support right now. This is a great support. We have two bottoms. Okay, um, The price is encouragingly past the 10-week MA, and we believe that the price will make its way past the uh, 50 MA, sorry, 40 MA as well, and go further up. We believe the probability is very high. And uh, if you check today's today's performance in the China index, you will see there has been a big spike up. There was a big spike up as well. To I guess that corroborates what we've been what we did last week. Okay, so this is very encouraging. Going deeper, you notice this is the same chart. You notice that uh, this pattern where it broke up from. Uh, you, you can call this an ascending triangle, triangle breakout, and it broke out here. Today, it's up to here. It spiked up today, by the way. And is this also significant because the breakout from this, uh, okay, uh, the breakout from this this uh, triangle also coincided with this large, long-term resistance line, making it more significant. And the MACD has crossed. So now it's a great time, we believe, to go along China. Okay, and uh, I think that's all we have. So in summary, long commodities, here's your index, long all service sectors, short gold, short the treasuries, and long China. Uh, I, I suppose our biggest conviction would be treasury short and China long, uh, and, but the rest are still favorable. Okay, we are finally done. I'm sorry for taking so long. Uh, any questions? Okay, thanks, Kenneth. So as uh, Kenneth has mentioned in this slide, if you want to enter the market, you can do it via ETF or CFDs. The names are all listed on this slide. And um, let's see, what are the questions? Do we have any questions? I think the main question um, that I have so far um, from the audience is, if we were to talk about Singapore, what uh, how much more leg do you think uh, the Singapore market has and what sort of uh, is it bull or bear what kind of direction do you think it is in sorry give me a second uh, can you repeat that question again the question is if we were to talk about the Singapore market what uh, what kind of um, leg is it in Okay, Singapore market is a bit tricky, all right. Um, you see, it's hard to do this sort of analysis on the Singapore market because you don't have so much information. You can't do a big sector rotation analysis. So what we like to do is we like to see where the U.S. market is going and and we hope for a good correlation. That being said, uh, I believe Singapore right now is also in a fifty fifty region. Uh, you could go long and you could go short. I, I mean, I'm sad to say something like this, but that's precisely where we are. Uh, if you asked me this question last month, I could have very easily told you that we're having a correction. But right now, we've already had one correction, and the, we have to see what the price does to see whether there's another cycle down or up. Although I must say, today's action was encouraging. Thank you. Um, oh, okay, we've got a gold question. So, um, Kenneth, do you mind going back to the gold chart and um, point out where are the resistance and support levels? Okay. Um, essentially, the biggest resistance level is right here, this blue zone. Okay. 
when you're dealing with commodities, right, you need to look at zones, not exact levels. All right. So this is a very strong resistance level. Any move to this level, I feel, is a great time to go short. Okay. Uh, right now, it's iffy. It's iffy because the MACD is actually crossed. That's the thing. It's actually crossed, right? Uh, at the same time, the candle. I know you can't see this candle here, but it's actually an indecision candle. So this tells me it can go either way. All right. But what I'm trying to say is that if this MACD is true and has a short cycle up then this will probably go higher. When it goes higher, I'm saying that this is a big resistance here. And as another gauge for resistance, this is your momentum resistance. When the RSI reaches this level, this is also a resistance as well, a momentum one. So you can look at this and this to gauge your big levels. Okay. Obviously, if the price from here just decides to tank from here, well, well, then you can just go short, I suppose. So would it be right to say that we have to wait for a few more days or maybe a few more weeks before we get a clearer entry level? Or yes, can we I would just... say you need to wait. No, you, I suggest you wait for one more week. And what you would do is you look at the last candle, which is this. Uh, I know you can't see it, but it's this. And you want to see for the next candle whether it closes above the high of the last, last weekly candle or whether it closes below the low of the last candle. And I think that will probably give you a good indication of whether it's going to go to hit this level here or whether it's going to just come down from, from where it is right now. So right now, you can't tell because it's an indecision candle. You, you have to wait one week at least. Okay, so for those who are thinking of trading gold, please be patient. We only need to wait for a week before we know where, you know, sort of where we're going to long or short it. Yeah, but just remember that long term, we are still bearish. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I do have one question, um, again about the Singapore market, equity market. So the audience would like to know which are the strong and weak sectors in the, on the STI. Okay, the STI is a bit tricky. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because sometimes um, what you think is in a sector isn't, the business model is such that it's not exactly in the sector and the sample size is too small and that's why I hesitate um, I hesitate to say okay but what you can do is this all right on a global scale we believe that commodities are going to improve okay we believe that crude oil will remain at this level or if it comes down it'll just come down by a bit all right so crude oil will be healthy and we believe that commodities are going to turn or uh, things like uh, copper, for example, should turn around soon as long as the uh, the world economy stays robust or stays at an expansion level. So that being said, you can look at the companies that will do well in a higher oil price environment, uh, which which indirectly means, uh, for example, your oil service sectors, they will definitely benefit. Okay, or companies that have to deal with uh, commodities. Now, a good proxy for commodities is actually China, by the way, if you believe that, uh, if you, because they, they do mine a lot of those commodities. Or, okay. or rather, it's called, yeah. I'm going to unmute one of our viewers, Vincent, because he's raised his virtual hand. Um, Vincent, go ahead. You have a question for Kenneth. Hi, Vincent, are you still there? Okay, looks like he's not. It's not there. He's self muted. Ah, yes, yes, we hear you. Go ahead, Vincent. Vincent, are you still there? Hi, can Vincent. You hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Yeah. Uh, basically, my question is like that. Uh, with the coming uh, uh, Fed meeting on the tapering effect, uh, I'd like to know and understand uh, what would you see uh, would the outlook be for the US market? Kenneth, did you with get tapering, that? Okay. Uh, it, the question to me is with the coming tapering, right, coming into effect, what, do I, what effect do you see in the US market? Okay, the, the effect is actually really simple, uh, as I mentioned in this thing. One, 
first of all, if there is going to be tapering, it's actually an indication that the U.S. economy is improving. The Fed will not taper unless they were confident of that. Okay. Um, at the same time, because of the tapering, you can expect the the, tre the the treasury bonds to come down. So the tapering effect will be bearish on the longer term treasuries. And two years later, when the Fed increases rates, right, that will be bearish on the short term treasuries as well. So that's going to affect the treasuries. Now, where stocks are concerned, right, the, the, the interesting correlation is that the, the Fed won't do this unless they were confident that the that the, that the economy was healthy, and hence um, it's possible for 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 equities to still do well even during the initial the initial uh, tapering phase. Essentially, of course, the event itself might cause some technical volatility itself, but we believe that the U.S. economy is robust and that should correct itself. Okay, thank you. I hope, hope that answers your question. Mm, are there any more questions? We'll take one more question if there are any questions. All right, looks like your presentation was very clear and nobody had any queries. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Um, or they're just you. too tired to ask questions. Well, um, a lot of people are typing in saying thank you, um, saying that your webinar is very good. So uh, some of you have been asking about the slides. We are going to re we have already recorded this webinar and it will be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So you can still go and view it um, tomorrow. As for the PDF version of the slides, unfortunately, you have to email Kenneth directly. So, uh, Kenneth, do you mind giving out your email address to the audience? Or, or you know, Melissa, can, can we do this? Uh, can I just give you the slides and can you handle the consolidation and emailing to the rest of the people? Is oh, right? okay. If that's the case, um, once you exit this webinar, you will see a survey. Those who answer the survey will then get the um, webinar slides. I think that's fair, right? <laughs> Oh, I think you've got a fan, Kenneth. Um, <laughs> one uh, client I do. That, yeah, one client said that she'll follow you every week. <laughs> you've got a fan now. Uh, okay, thank you. I hope I won't, I hope I, I won't disappoint you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for the great feedback. Um, we are planning to do more webinars, but uh, with Kenneth and maybe some of the other research analysts, we haven't come up with a full plan yet because. Um, we want to get feedback from you guys as well. So that's why the survey is very important. We want to know what kind of webinars you want to hear, um, what sort of topics you are interested in, um, or besides webinars, would you like face-to-face -face seminars as well? So please give us as much feedback um, as possible. And if you have any other feedback that you forgot to do in the survey, just email us at cfd at philip.com.sg we will be reading and we do take your feedback very, very seriously. If you can't uh, remember our email address, we are also on Twitter. You can look for twitter.com slash philipcfd or you can also look at us, uh, find us on Facebook. See, we are on all types of media. Very easy for you to track us down and give us your opinions and ideas. So thank you once more. Um, for oh, can, I, can I end off with uh, something? Can I end yeah. off with something? Sorry. Yeah, okay, just uh, one, two things okay, real quick before we go. Um, also just note um, that the research side, um, Philip Securities Research, we have a weekly webinar um, every Monday, 11, uh, 15 a.m. And uh, you can actually tune into that if you want uh, uh, a bit more macro outlooks as well as some stock recommendations. So please tune into that if, uh, if you like. And... Um, uh, yep. Thank, thanks for listening to our presentation. Um, please uh, trade and invest well. Hope you make money. And if you do, please think of me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kenneth. And if you're wondering where you can sign up for the webinar, you can go to philipcfd.com slash education slash seminars. 
we will put it up every week so you can just sign up automatically and just listen in um, at 11.15. If you miss it, there are recorded versions. They are all up on the Philip Capital YouTube, not Philip CFD, but Philip Capital YouTube channel. Um, or I think it's also on UniPhilip. So you can just go to philip.com.sg or poems.com.sg to find them. So in the meanwhile, we will try to plan more of such webinars and we will definitely invite you and hope to see you virtually on these webinars. So thank you so much. Have a good evening. And US markets are going to open in 20 minutes time. Get ready um, to trade. Happy trading, everybody.